It's now time for the Billy C Show. Part of the BillyCBoxing.com network. And we're coming to you live from the Billy C. Studios in Lake George, New York. I'm Bill Caligiron. It's time for the Billy C. Show. Good morning, good day, good evening, whenever you're watching, whenever you're listening. I hope you're doing okay today. Today's show is being brought to you by my book, Tom Molino, From Bondage to Baddest Men on the Planet. is available right now where all good books are sold. You can get a copy right now where you're watching or listening to this show. Just go to Amazon.com. And get it there, or you can go to Barnes and Noble, or drop me an email, uh, Bill at BillyCBoxing.com, or Billy at Talking Boxing, T A L K I N B O X I N G dot com. Hey, listen, uh, I want to apologize uh, first and foremost uh, to uh, uh, anyone that uh, was expecting me to go live at my normal time, because I mean, you know, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. But uh, some uh, things came up where I would not be able to go live. Uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern, but I didn't want to not do the show, so I'm doing it now, so hopefully uh, the people that tune in at 5 will see the recording and watch the show. Anyway, I want to start off by uh, saying Canelo Alvarez and Terrence Crawford, there's been a lot of talk about the potential matchup between these two. Uh, Terrence Crawford uh, would have to move up uh, not one, not two, but three weight classes uh, to fight Canelo. Um my thoughts on this is I think it's I, I, I think it's good. I think it's good for boxing. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Terrence Crawford is a unique fighter. I think that Terrence Crawford uh, is pound for pound number one fighter in the world above Canelo. Um, you know, I've said this uh, for a long time about Crawford. And, you know, for the longest time, he used to piss me off when I heard people tell me that he was overrated. He never oh, he never fought anybody and all of this crap. Uh, which is all uh, BS with a capital B and a capital shit, okay? It's bullshit because Terrence Crawford, if people forget that when he busted out onto the scene uh, several years back, he was the B-side, and he kept winning. And then finally somebody uh, said, you know what? Hey, hey, I think we got something here. This Terrence Crawford from Omaha, Nebraska. Maybe it's not just a built-up record, and we pro- and that's proved uh, to be the case uh, the truth of the matter is, this cat is uh, a quality fighter. He's a good human being, and he's got that that knack for flipping the switch uh, when uh, uh, the bell rings. Okay, he's got a mean streak that uh, uh, really I haven't seen in a, in a while. I mean, I, all right, I'm not comparing him to uh, who I'm about to say, but. This guy had a mean streak, too, for the longest time, and then it kind of fizzled out a little bit. But Mike Tyson, no, he's not the same style fighter, and, and I'm for there's no way I'm comparing Crawford to Mike Tyson, two different fighters in uh, uh, different weight classes in different eras. But the mean streak part, and I think that Terrence Crawford has that legitimate switch that he flips. And uh, similar, i tell you another guy I'll compare him to, uh, is and again not stylistically wise, but flipping the switch is uh, the late great Jack Dempsey. Um, both both uh, Tyson and Dempsey, and of course Terence Crawford. Uh, when the bell rang, uh, they're different people in the ring, and uh, they focus on it. Now, with that, all that said, all those accolades said for Terence Crawford, you know, moving up uh, not one, not two, but three weight classes to fight arguably uh, the best uh, super middleweight uh, on the planet today in Saul Canelo Alvarez uh, would be quite a feat. But but here's here's the reason why I think it makes sense. First of all, if you take a look at Terrence Crawford and you look at his record and you look at the, his past. Now, if you recall, he was under the, the uh, uh, promotional team of top rank, Bob Arum and top rank. And I said all along that I didn't think that... Uh, that top rank did him any favors uh, while he was with them. He, they really didn't. 
They uh, they failed to get him the big fights. Hey, uh, anybody that's watching live right now, I, I know we, we kicked off the show uh, uh, almost five hours or four hours uh, early. Uh, come on in the chat room and, and uh, give me some uh, uh, of your thoughts, and we'll talk about it. But, um, you know, when he was with Top Rank, when Terrence Crawford was with, uh, Crawford was with Top Rank, they didn't do him any favors. They didn't get him the big fights. Uh, uh, you know, I think that that was also uh, a reason why people didn't uh, uh, believe that he was as good as I always thought he was. Um, but he's on his own now, and he isn't it, towards the end of his career. There's no question about that. Um, and he needs a uh, – listen, let's face it. The, the guy's looking for a payday. How many, How? Who else can he fight that uh, he's going to make the money – uh, that he would against uh, Canelo Alvarez. There's nobody else out there. You know, uh, there was a uh, 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 there was a comment made um, by uh, Antonio Tarver. Speaking of Antonio Tarver, did you hear that Antonio Tarver and Roy Jones Jr. are going to have a, a fight? I, I, I mean, you know, th- this is this is the kind of stuff. Juggernaut, uh, thank you for the accolades uh, in the chat room. Uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that makes people just shake their head and not tune into boxing. You know, 50, 50 years old plus fighting each other. Okay, they're saying it's a, uh, it's a, a, a uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, not a real match uh, exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brain. Uh, but, uh, you know, even so, who the hell wants to see it? You know, it's the same thing, which I'll get to in a little bit later. Manny Pacquiao. Uh, him claiming that him and Mayweather are going to fight this year, uh, a rematch. Um, uh, you know, nothing. Uh, I haven't heard anything from the Mayweather side. Um, and, and, you know, those guys are both in their 40s. I, I hope that, you know, if, if they do have uh, a, a fight, Mayweather and, and Pacquiao, I, I hope it's not a exhibition you know these exhibitions have a tendency to end in a draw as we saw when Roy Jones Jr. fought Mike Tyson Mike Tyson beat the shit out of him and it became a draw uh but uh Antonio Tarver believes that um you know if if Crawford doesn't fight Spence next that the only guy that he should be fighting uh is uh is Enos and 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 I disagree first of all I don't think that um I don't believe that Terrence Crawford needs to even fight uh, um, Errol Spence. Errol Spence may never fight again. I mean, uh, he had uh, uh, some problems. He, he just had uh, the retina surgery. Um, and if he does fight, I doubt he's going to want to fight at any weight class. I doubt he's going to want to fight uh, Terrence Crawford. So, so the pickings are slim for Terrence. And I really think that a Terrence Crawford-Canelo Alvarez fight not only will, will draw um, you know, live and pay-per-view audiences because it will definitely be a pay-per-view. Uh, but I think it'll be an entertaining fight. And and I'm an, I'm a Canelo fan, all right? I didn't like uh, his ducking a Triple G during that whole thing, uh, waited and waited. But I got news for you. I'm going to tell you right now, right now, even before it's been signed, sealed, and delivered, I think, and people are going to, I know they're going to laugh at me and they're going to think I, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm predicting right now Terrence Crawford beats Canelo Alvarez. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, he's going to beat Canelo Alvarez because Terrence Crawford uh, takes his craft very seriously. So does Canelo. So does Canelo. And I believe given enough time, and this is where I think if Terrence Crawford is smart, which I think he is, um, I think that he should start training for this fight now, and I don't mean training and to, to burn himself out. I mean weight, gain the weight, put the weight on now, and just do some, you know, not, you know, high ten, uh, high uh, uh, density training uh, where he's, you know, preparing to get in the ring. I'm talking about put on the weight the correct way, you know, get his body used to uh, the, uh, uh, the weight and and walk around with that weight so it's not like you know sometimes these fighters um would uh uh when they go up in weight you know they 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 eat a bunch of sandwiches or whatever and they put on the weight and and they're really not used to the weight you know and they they're not the same i do believe terrence crawford can handle the weight i mean uh you know we're talking we're talking about a guy that will probably 
you know, come in to fight at 168, whereas Canelo Alvarez on fight night uh, would probably be, you know, at least uh, 175, maybe even 180. So uh, Terrence Crawford would be giving up uh, the size and weight. Um, but I don't think it matters. Um, I, I got news for you. Terrence Crawford is a better boxer than Canelo. And I think that, you know, Canelo would do what Canelo does. He'll try to break down uh, Crawford and, and eventually uh, uh, try to beat him, stop him. Uh, but Crawford's too smart. He's a crafty guy. He's got that jab. He's got the mean streak. He's got great footwork. Um, and he's got some pop. Will the pop be with him uh, in three weight classes above? I, I don't know. But accumulation of punches certainly would. And, uh, and, and Canelo Alvarez can be hit. Um, you know, we, we, saw, we saw what a talented boxer can do to Canelo uh, when we saw uh, Bivol beat him. Okay, so my prediction right now, early, and the fight's not even signed, uh, is that Terrence Crawford actually beats Canelo Alvarez. And I hope this fight happens. I do think it's a big fight for the sport of boxing. And I think it's really, if, if you look at it from a financial point of view, it's really the only option uh, that Terrence Crawford has that could make him the money that he's looking for. He's looking for a cash-out fight. Come on, do you blame him? Do you blame him? I mean, come on, all these guys that do this, um, you know, people are always critical and stuff like that. But Terrence Crawford is a, is a, is a guy that never got the pay checks that he should have. And I think that this fight would give him the paycheck. He's not going to get a paycheck fighting Enos. He's not going to get a paycheck fighting anybody, you know, uh, except for Canelo Alvarez. Canelo Alvarez is within reach uh, of, uh, of, of Crawford in terms of size and, and weight. I hope the fight happens, and uh, uh, I'm telling you now, I know it's early, uh, but, uh, uh, but I'm predicting uh, Terrence Crawford. We've got a couple people in the chat room. Straight face says Terrence is a master boxer. I think he be beats Canelo, too. You're right. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, look, it's easy for us to sit here and say that, but I'm being honest. You know, I, you, the, one of the reasons people don't like me is is i'm a straight shooter i tell it like it is i don't give a shit what anybody thinks you know and the truth of the matter is terrence crawford i've been i've been saying it on this show for years that he is uh way better than people give him credit for all of a sudden now oh he's a pound for pound fighter yeah no shit you know i mean this is a guy that that you know be, he, look whoever says he didn't fight anybody doesn't know boxing Okay, look at his record. Look at the stage of when he fought those guys, and they were all in their primes. You know, something uh, other people don't do. Uh, but uh, Canelo Alvarez versus Terrence Crawford, I think it would be good for I think it would be great for boxing. Um, and uh, my prediction is Crawford wins. And if he wins, man, would, uh, would that solidify uh, his legacy? And to tell you the truth, I think it would solidify his legacy even if he lost. Even if he lost. I think that the fact that he, he he's... I don't think Canelo goes and destroys him. I don't think Canelo knocks him out. You know, I don't think you're going to see, like, what happened to, to, to Charlo. You know, Canelo just battering him from ring post to ring post, and Charlo just wanted to survive. Charlo got in there for a paycheck, right? Charlo got in there for a paycheck, but that's all he was there for. He didn't fight. You could bet your last nickel... You could bet your last effing nickel that Terrence Crawford will come to fight. He would train and get in that ring to win the fight, not to survive the fight and not to just collect the paycheck. Terrence Crawford would get in the ring and fight Canelo at his weight class, at Canelo's weight class, and he will train to win the fight, and I predict that he will. All right, real quick, um, we got some uh, fight results that took place uh, this uh, last uh, weekend, and uh, a fight that uh, was 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 pretty cool. I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. Uh, Jaime uh, uh, Mungia, did I say it right? I've been criticized about how I've been mispronouncing his name, and it's Mungia. I even went to uh, uh, <laughs> I went to how do you pronounce? And I spelled it, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, Mungia uh, stopped uh, John Ryder. Uh, in what I thought was uh, a, a really good fight, uh, Mungia uh, improved to 43-0 and uh, with 34 knockouts. And, and I just want to say something. Speaking of 43-0, and okay, that's seven fights short of 50-0. and 
that Floyd Mayweather, despite the fact that there's been so many other fighters that have uh, reached 50 and 0 and beyond before their first loss, uh, that uh, you know uh, are better than or were was better than than Floyd. But let me tell you, uh, Mungia has a great chance um, if he plays his cards right of uh, surpassing um, 50 and 0. Okay. I'm just saying, and then I, you know, you know that that's the shtick with Mayweather that he retired, and he was smart enough to retire before um, you know somebody beat him. Um, you know, uh, Mungaya, excuse me, he's only 27 years old. Uh, you know, he's uh, got a great chance, and John the uh, John Ryder is was no easy. To, you know, despite now seven losses, he was no easy uh, win. Remember. Uh, Canelo didn't stop Ryder. Ryder gave him a good fight. And uh, Mungaya, he, he beat the hell out of him. You know, going into the fight, he was 42-0. and 0. Um, Some comments that I have, uh, you know, despite the commentators saying, oh, ever since he's been training with Freddie Roach, we see a difference with him. I didn't. I mean, I... He's got 43 fights. He's the same fighter that I've seen. I've I've seen a lot of his fights. I, he hasn't changed. He fights the same way. Uh, it, you know, he dropped a, a, a rider in the second round. He drops him in the fourth. To me, he started looking tired uh, by the uh, uh, um, fourth round. But he ran out to start the third. Uh, he, like I said, by the time the knockdown came in the fourth, I thought he looked fired, uh, tired. Uh, I didn't think he should be tired. He's only 27. He's got the youthful energy. Uh, by the seventh round, he clearly was tired. His mouth was open. He was plotting. Um, but he attacked, you know, the, the commentators were saying, oh, it looks like he's taking this round off, which I'm saying to myself, he's 27 years old. You know, why does he have to take a round off? And, uh, you know, considering what he did in the eighth round, uh, he totally attacked John Ryder. Uh and, uh, you know, Ryder, although Ryder finished strong, and he shot his load, by the way, in the eighth round. Uh, and uh, uh, Ryder finished strong, um, but uh, 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 in the ninth round, uh, what it looked like, uh, it was a powerful right hand, uh, almost like a, 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 a you know, it, it almost looked like a, a snappy uh, jab to me. I mean, that's, uh, it, it just was a powerful straight right hand, uh, dropped Ryder. Um, and then he was uh, dropped again um, in the ninth. He, he was in real trouble. Uh, but the stupid referee was about to let him uh, continue the fight. Uh, it, 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 the corner's trying to stop it. They're standing on the ring, waving the, the towel. Uh, you know, they wanted to stop it. Everybody saw that the fight needed to be stopped. Even the janitor that was cleaning up some beer spills in, in the third row, he saw it. Everybody saw it. And then finally they had to ring the bell to get the referee's attention to stop the fight. I mean, uh, you know, what a terrible, terrible referee job. I mean, you know, people are critical of referees that stop the fights too soon, but it's it's better than letting it go too far. I mean, uh, Ryder was in trouble. That fight needed to be stopped, and thank thank God it was. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, I think uh, Mungaya still needs to develop a defense. He has no defense, boys and girls. He doesn't. He takes way too many shots. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, when Ryder was getting pummeled, uh, Mungaya was, was very susceptible to the counterpunch uh, and, and was landing the counterpunches on Mungaya. A, a, a better level fighter would, would, could possibly hurt Mungaya. I, I think he needs to work on defense. Um, he takes way too many punches. He has absolutely no head movement. I, I, I really was watching to see if he moved his head at all, and, and he, he doesn't, you know, and, um, I, you know, that's dangerous. He's, he's very heavy-handed. There's no question, and he did, I, I will admit, I did notice him up on his toes really for the first time. I, I never really uh, noticed him bouncing on his toes uh, trying to box, but like I say to uh, young fighters, and I've said on this show many, many times, you know, it's human nature to always revert back to what comes to you naturally. And when fighters uh, that, um, in Mungai's case, a, a fighter like him who's who's been so successful uh, with his power and stuff like that, 
when when they try to learn and and uh, you know credit to to trainers that try to you know uh teach fighters new things when they when they learn something and like in this case mungaya he learns uh you know how to get up on his toes as soon as the guy gets tired or he gets in trouble they automatically snap back to what comes naturally and that's beating the hell out of you you know and and coming after you and trying to let your hands go and and that's when he's going to be susceptible to uh uh to be uh getting some uh getting into some trouble um you know oscar de la hoya i just want to say i'm going to talk about him a little later you know i i saw the interview with him for this fight and the beauty of oscar de la hoya at at least this version of oscar is that he does want to work with other promoters like uh, Bob Arum and his top rank, uh, Eddie Hearn and his matchroom, Frank Warren and his promotional company, and all, or I should say most of the smaller promoters, uh, they all will work with him except Al Heyman and the PBC, which I think was one of the worst uh, things that ever happened to the sport of boxing, Al Heyman and the PBC. Uh, the PBC fighters, as far as I'm concerned, they're all frauds. Uh, the only couple of good ones aren't fighting anymore. Um, they're frauds, and they're being exposed left and right. Al Heyman saw the blueprint that uh, Dana White and the UFC made, and he saw the success. And that, boys and girls, is what he's trying to do with the PBC. You know, remember, uh, this is how quickly boxing fans have a ten at least young boxing fans have a tendency to forget. When he busted out onto the scene with the PBC, Everybody was praising him that he saved boxing. And he was saying how good he's going to be for the fighters and how much more money they're going to make. And boxing's going to be on free TV. And it was for the first year. Now, everything that he does costs you money. And he's delivering a shit product. Okay? I'm going to get to that in a second. But uh, uh, Oscar De La Hoya trying to work uh, with uh, with the other promoters. And, um, you know, I, I, just, uh, I, I just don't get how boxing fans uh, actually drink the BS Kool-Aid that the PBC uh, passes around. Um, It's a joke, and it's hurting the sport. I I really think it's hurting the sport. Um, I just want to touch on a fight that took place uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Otor Biederbeev knocked out uh, Callum Smith. There was no surprise there, um, at least in my opinion. Um... You know, Smith was battered and, and uh, beaten uh, pretty badly by, by the sixth round. And after the second knockdown in the seventh, uh, Buddy McGirt, who in my opinion is one of the most underrated trainers in the sport of boxing today, if I was a young fighter, the first guy I'd want to sign up with is Buddy McGirt. Um, but uh, uh, he did the right thing. And uh, he stopped the fight when it looked like the referee was going to let it continue again. I just, I just couldn't believe it. A couple of uh, things I noticed. I don't know if anybody else caught this, um, but, um, but uh, Beater Beef. Uh, it looks like we lost uh, uh, our connection here, so I uh, apologize for that. Uh, hopefully, uh, that'll uh, uh, come back here in a second. Um, uh, but I'm going to keep rolling. Uh, you know, the uh, here we go. We're back. We're back. Sorry about that. We lost uh, connection for a second. Uh, I was just about to give some thoughts on um, uh, Beater Beeves gloves. I don't know if anybody else noticed this, uh, but I certainly did. Um, you know, his gloves had those uh, white line designs in them. I don't know if you recall seeing it. There was... Um, like these lines on his gloves, uh, which matched his, his trunks and stuff. Um, I don't think they should have been allowed to, to, to be used. It was almost like a, a hip hypnotic, uh, a hypnotic thing, uh, in my, uh, in, in my opinion, you know, I, I don't think they should have let him, uh, uh, let it use. I thought it was a hundred percent, uh, distraction, you know, it's like, you know, if you're ever f- trying to follow an object, uh, those gloves were, were hypnotizing. I, I mean, listen, I don't think the gloves made any difference uh, for uh, Smith. I think it was inevitable what the end was going to be. Uh, but uh, I'm really shocked that the commission uh, let those gloves pass. My thoughts on the broadcast in general, uh, Timothy Bradley on ESPN. Uh, listen, this guy knows his shit. 
and he's very technically informative uh, during the fights, and I've always loved Timothy Bradley. Uh, have had him on the show a couple of times uh, years ago, and uh, uh, what a great guy. What a great human being. Um, Joe Tessitore, Tess, Tess as everyone calls him at ESPN, I love him as a football guy, but as a boxing commentator, he's grown into someone who's really hard to listen because he's such a company man. I'll give you an example. During this whole fight, I can't remember how many times, because you needed a clicker to keep track, how many times he kept pointing out round after round after round how Smith has never been down in his career. Smith has never been down in his career. He's never been down, never been down, never been down. And if no one else saw that they knew damn well that Smith was going to be going down in this fight, he was just setting up for when he got to say, he's been down for the first time in his career. He yells. It, it was so choreographed to me. It made me sick. It really, it made me sick. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, you, know, you know how I think of Bernardo uh, Usun right? But uh, uh, Mark Kriegel, Mark Kriegel is terrible. I mean, he sounds and acts like he's better than everybody else. And truthfully, aside from info he obtains during the interviews, I'm not sure he knows much about the sport of boxing. Uh, I've never heard him really say anything technical. Um, you know, he, he, he's, he's a guy that, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I think he's trying uh, to act like Larry Merchant, to be, to be honest with you. And I just, you know, I've been criticized. My, my main man, Alice Papali, has, has uh, disagreed with me on this. But I, I, I believe that boxing's for regular people, man. You know, the regular guy likes to box. I mean, we started this show 21 years ago. And the premise of the show was I wanted it to seem like there were just a couple of guys BSing at a, at a bar or whatever uh, and talking about boxing. I remember that fight. Oh, do you remember someone? So, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that's what we tried to do this show about. And those are the kind of people that I believe uh, boxing w was intended for. Uh, we don't need any uppity uppities uh, that, you know, are trying to uh, make uh, – uh, boxing uh, more than what it is. It's a com it's it's a it's a combat sport. The object is to render your opponent unconscious. I mean, I, you you can't sugarcoat it. You know, you can't. Uh, so uh, that's that. Hey, I want to give a shout out uh, to uh, uh, my man Clinton McKenzie. He's uh, a former uh, B B B B B B of C uh, super lightweight champion, and he owns. Uh, uh, a, a gym in London, Mackenzie Boxing and Fitness, and I would love to do a show from there. I, uh, Mc, uh, Mackenzie and I, uh, I should, I'm sorry, Clinton Mackenzie and I, um, you know, communicate a little bit through social media, and uh, I would love to, to, to do a show there. He would love to have us there too, so we're trying to work on uh, some sponsors, so if you know anybody uh, that would love to get uh, us to do the show live from London, uh, reach out. We'd love to make it uh, happen. Um, all right, so some boxing news that I want to get to. Uh, Joseph Parker and Zahili Zhang uh, are uh, officially the co-feature for the March 8th fight uh, taking place in Saudi Arabia. You know, I, I, I like this fight. Um, you know, I, I do think that Parker, Parker was in the driver's seat um, I think that he could have gotten uh, some other fights. I, I, I don't think people are going to be so quick to fight him, especially after he uh, beat uh, uh, Deontay Wilder. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm, I give Zhang credit. I don't think Zhang is going to beat him. Uh, he's too slow. Um, Zhang, who's 26 wins, one loss, one draw, 21 comes uh, by knockout. Um, he's uh, uh, he scored a back-to-back uh, stoppage wins over Joe Joyce. Um, you know, uh, they were big fights uh, for Zhang, and they were the only big fights on his record. Um, you know, uh, Joseph Parker has fought, uh, you know, uh, the best of the heavyweight division, really, uh, at, at least, uh, you know, recently. And um, I, I just, I, 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 I like the fight. I, I just think Joseph Parker... Uh, is uh, is the man to beat uh, in that uh, matchup. Uh, the giant from China, 40 years old, um, you know, he, he's got a granite chin. 
He's six foot six, almost three hundred pounds. Well, two hundred and eighty-seven. Uh, I uh, I think uh, Parker's going to outbox him, and uh, I think uh, I think it's going to be uh, um, a fight that is going to be a showcase for for Parker. I got uh, my man Amuk in the chat room saying he's got Zhang winning. Cool. Well, hey, listen, when you can uh, have multiple people picking opposite sides of a fight, that's telling you it's a good matchup. You know, you look at these lines on fights now, you know, you lay in two grand to win 100 bucks. I mean, that's how lopsided they are. Also, uh, Ray Vargas is on that card uh, defending his uh, WBC featherweight title uh, against uh, uh, Nick Ball. So uh, that's a good one. Um, speaking of the PBC, and, and this backs up what I was just saying, uh, before, okay. Um, Amazon prime, which somehow Al Heyman sweet talked his way into getting professional boxing on Amazon prime, which doesn't surprise me. I think, uh, Amazon prime should have more boxing, just not the PBC because the PBC is nothing but a bunch of frauds. And, uh, this is going to prove it. So I don't know, uh, if you've, uh, uh, followed the uh, bouncing ball of the title uh, for the 154-pound title, um, but um, the uh, uh, the fight that is uh, going to be taking place. Um, well, let me. I'll get to that in a second. This, but this um, card that's taking place on March 30th. Okay, uh, which is. Uh, uh, this uh, prime, uh, this Amazon Prime fight. Keith Thurman uh, is uh, uh, going to be fighting Tim Tazu for Tazu's WBO uh, title. Well, wait, that's right. The WBO grew a pair of you know what's, and they wouldn't sanction it. Why should they? Keith Thurman, he, he hasn't fought in over two years, twenty five months to be exact. It's a joke, and the fact that it's a pay per view is even more of a joke. You know. Uh, PBC, this is the kind of fights they deliver to us, all right? And uh, Sebastian Fundora and Serhi uh, uh, Boachuk, they, they're going to be fighting uh, for one of the titles. Remember, Charlo was stripped uh, of his belts, except for the PBC, who's got him uh, listed as a champion in recess, which is total bullshit. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, Tim Tazoo against Keith Thurman... How does Keith Thurman get this fight? How does Keith Thurman get this fight? Tim Tazu doesn't care. It's not a title defense. You know, he'll beat the hell out of Keith Thurman. Keith Thurman was one of the most wasted talents I've ever seen. And maybe he was never talented at all. You know, uh, all the excuses. Uh, Keith Thurman is, is, a, is, is totally embarrassing for the sport of boxing. And so is the PBC, in my opinion. It's embarrassing that they're doing it. But I love what Tim Tazu says. Uh, He wanted to fight Jamel Charlo because Jamel Charlo at the time was the guy that was in charge of the 154-pound division, okay? He chose to fight uh, Canelo for the paycheck, and he uh, laid an egg, okay? He he was a stinker. Um, And Tim Tazu got elevated to the champ. Uh, They vacated the other ones except for uh, the WBC. And uh, Tazu says... Um, I've come to the conclusion that I'm never going to fight him, meaning uh, Jermel Charlo, because he's a coward. Finally, all of the sanctioning bodies are realizing that he's a fraud. He went so hard to win the belts, but it's harder to keep him. And that's what Tazu said. And, you know, to be honest with you, you know, that is a true statement. Um, But uh, uh, but the Charlo brothers, in my opinion, uh, were were frauds. They they both are frauds. Um, you know, Jermel at least uh, won all the belts, uh, but they were set up for him. They were uh, they were layups. It was uh, the, the 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 champions and or the vacant titles that he won as well. Um, you know, I, it just the the Charlo brothers are exactly what the PBC is about. Frauds. Um, speaking of the WBC. Uh, earlier, I don't, I don't want you to uh, combine that with the word fraud because I don't think they're a fraud. But uh, um, it was ordered by the WBC that heavyweight Frank Ch- uh, Sanchez and AJ KBL uh, have to fight an elimination bout, um, and they're they're in free uh, negotiation period right now. 
Um, and this is where you got to um, really uh, uh, follow the bouncing belt because Anthony Joshua, So, and, and this is my big hang-up with the sanctioning bodies. As long as you don't have a championship belt, they'll, you know, rank you. And, and in my opinion, even though you have somebody else's belt, if, if you're the, another sanctioning body, you should still rank the fighter. Um, you know, because the object of being ranked is for us to see who the top fighters are in that division, regardless of the sanctioning body. Most fans don't really care about which sanctioning body it is. They just know he's number seven, and, and he's ranked at number seven. You know, and Dan's, oh, well, which, which sanctioning body is he in? Well, no. That's there. There goes the dilution of uh, of the sport of boxing and all the sanctioning bodies. But uh, Frank Sanchez. So the the Anthony Joshua right now, and and that's another thing. I think that that um, uh, champions need to fight the number one contender. And if you're going to have to have an elimination bout, it has to be against uh, the number one and number two guy to win the right to fight the champ or. Um, you know, that's another thing. They have spots that are open. You, you look at the sanctioning bodies, you got uh, not rated, not rated for one and two, but then they have ratings all the way down for after that. Why isn't number three number one if you don't have a guy to put in number one? Because it's all about the do re me. You know, whoever, what, what can you put in my left hand to make me write your name on our sanctioning top ten list with my right hand? Um, anyway, Anthony Joshua. WBC's number one ranked contender as of now. However, he's fighting, uh, and, and uh, uh, they would say that he's uh, uh, would fight Philip Hergovic, uh to get the title shot. However, he's fighting Nagano. So uh, if uh, Anthony Joshua uh, beats uh, 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 Nagano, chances are... Uh, uh, Philip Hergovic and he will fight for the for the uh, IBF title because it's already projected that the winner of Fury Usyk uh, is going to be stripped of the uh, IBF belt. So if that takes place, then the current number one ranking that Anthony Joshua has with the WBC goes away. You know, Joseph Parker. Who's, a, who's the former WBO champ, is ranked at number three by the WBC. But because he's challenging Zhang for his uh, interim WBO belt, that means he's, if he wins, he's going to be taken out of the WBC rankings, right? You know, so it's, it's crazy. So what do you do? You keep going down the list, down the list, down the list, and poof, you got Frank Sanchez against KBL. I like the fight. I like the fight. I just don't like how it got made. Um, speaking of some more news, uh, Ryan Garcia. Um, you know, this is becoming, a, I don't know if you guys have been following this, but Ryan Garcia uh, has become uh, uh, quite the soap opera, uh, The uh, as the stomach turns, it's called. And, um, you know, Ryan Garcia, Oscar De La Hoya, and Mayweather, right? So Ryan Garcia made some uh, comments uh, about uh, Mayweather and uh, and Oscar De La Hoya. He said that he's really close. They're good friends with Mayweather. He said, and I quote, this is a quote from Garcia. He says, uh, this is uh, um, my problem when people ask me about Oscar De La Hoya. He wants them to stop going to the media and bashing Floyd. There's no reason. Uh, De La Hoya just did that because he was mad. At the end of the day, Floyd is, influ Floyd is influential to me. It's a normal conversation we have. Uh, Mayweather said, so why don't you try and get a belt and then go fight Haney for a bigger unification? It makes more sense and there's more money at stake. I said, I don't know, Floyd. I gave people my word. And this is typical Floyd because Floyd doesn't give anyone his word. His word is worth garbage. And Floyd says, well, things change. And he gave me, uh, I'm just going to keep it short and simple. And I was like, all right, Floyd, gave you what? Your advice? He stopped short of saying that because that would have uh, backed up what Oscar was complaining about. 
He says, he continued, and he said, I look up to Floyd a lot. I love the guy. That's why I went out on a limb to defend him online when I didn't really have to because I genuinely know he has a big heart. He's got a huge heart. He's authentic. He's, he, does he like money? Yeah, but he also loves blessing people. He tries his best. Me and Floyd have gotten really close, and I really value our relationship. He's actually just called me. Um, you know, he was asked about if what he thinks the differences between Oscar De La Hoya and Floyd Mayweather, and he said uh, the key difference has to do with authenticity. He says uh, uh, Oscar is getting to the point where he's becoming his true self. He's goofy, crazy, and whatever he wants to be, just kind of living in truth. Floyd has always been living in truth. He's as real as it comes. Um, he said they asked him about Oscar De La Hoya's career as a professional fighter. And this is where this uh, interview went totally off the rails because uh, this guy, Ryan Garcia, says Oscar had a lot of potential. I just think Oscar didn't reach his fullish potential. He let all the bullshit get to him. This isn't this shit is bullshit. All the fame, all the money, all the girls, that is bullshit. There's only one purpose, and that's God. Well, I'll agree with uh, one purpose being God. That I agree with. But to suggest that Oscar De La Hoya didn't reach his full potential, that's bullshit. And and I have said those exact words uh, about Floyd Mayweather. And, and the reason why I say that is, you know, everyone that, likes Floyd Mayweather, says that he's the best just because. He didn't have to actually fight a guy to show that he was better because he said he could beat him. So that gives him the, the credit right there, which I disagree with. I think that you earn your stripes in the ring. And Oscar De La Hoya fought everybody. Nobody could say that Oscar De La Hoya ducked anyone during his uh, professional career. Never. Did he duck a fighter? Floyd Mayweather ducked many. So to compare the careers of the two, of putting aside uh, the the O, which uh, Floyd has and and Oscar doesn't, uh, is total crazed. It's 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 nuts in my opinion. Um, all right, some fights that are coming up that uh, are on TV that I'm looking forward to. I'm going to break down this weekend's card. Uh, well, just two fights on the card. Uh, but uh, February 8th, which is Thursday, which we'll be doing our next show. And uh, uh, I'm being, uh, um, you know, I'm I'm going to do a, 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 a breakdown of that fight uh, the night of, which is Thursday. I, I like the fights during the week. I used to love Tuesday night fights, and uh, and I like it. Um, getting a comment uh, here. Um uh, Amok says uh, Mello is a weight bully that ducked Lara. Yeah, I, listen, uh, the Charlo brothers uh, to me are, are frauds with a capital F. Uh, my man Mike says De La Hoya is a bit of a, I think he meant crook, but he says he's a bit of a cook, uh, but he fought them all in their prime. Uh, he did. And Mike, that's my point. You know, nobody can say, I, I think that I, 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 I me personally, I think that Ryan Garcia is being conned by Floyd. Floyd's the best con man out there. I mean, look what he's done to his fans all these years. You know, he cons them into paying for, for subpar matches against over-the-hill fighters or people that shouldn't even be in the ring with Floyd. And, and I always thought that Floyd never showed us the best. I think Floyd maybe could be regarded as one of the best ever if he fought the best, but he never did. I honestly believe that we never saw Floyd at his absolute best in the ring because he never challenged himself once he went on his own. He was in some tough fights. He was an exciting fighter back when he was with top rank. Go back and watch some of those fights. Exciting. You know, it, it, it's, it reminds me of a guy that I think is uh, today is one of the most underrated fighters. He's no longer with us. I was a friend of his. Um, after uh, his greatness, uh, but Hector Macho Camacho was one of the greatest fighters ever to put on a pair of gloves. Before the Edwin Rosario fight, this guy had it all. He had charisma. 
He was a ticket seller. He had hand speed. He had knockout power. He had footwork. He had defense. You couldn't hit the guy. Yeah, I mean, and he went in there for the kill. And, and, and he changed his style, you know, after the Rosario fight. Because, let's face it, Edwin Rosario beat the snot out of Hector. And it was a, it was a blessing that they gave. It was a robbery that they gave the win to Hector. I love Hector. And Hector Jr. too. And, and the truth... Not that Hector Jr. was as good as a fighter, but he's a great guy. Um, and, you know, people that don't or are too young to have seen Hector Camacho in his prime in the 80s, um, you missed out. Go back and watch some of that footage. This is a guy that was a great fighter, great fighter. Very similar to Floyd when Floyd was young with top rank. Floyd was going for... Uh, knockouts. He was being aggressive. He was all these things. Uh, and then he went on his own and he became uh, that uh, track star that we all know. Uh, but uh, uh, aside from uh, uh, Thursday night, Tiafimo Lopez against uh, uh, Jamie Ortiz, that's going to be for the WBO Junior Welterweight title. February 10th, Liam Dillon against Reese uh, Bellotti on the zone. Hey, listen, if, if you're going to get one thing out of this upcoming TV schedule, um, you're going to see that the zone clearly has taken uh, the lead in, in broadcasting boxing because they'll put on anything from uh, like a club show all the way up to, you know, the best versus the best. I, I, I think the zone has been the best thing for the sport of boxing. Um, February 15th, the return of another exciting fighter, who is not afraid to fight anybody, Jojo Diaz. Jojo, Jojo Diaz is taking on Jesus Perez. Um, February 16th, you got Adrian uh, Carell going against, <clears throat> I'm not, I, uh, let's just say, uh, not Shinga. I can't even pronounce his first name, but uh, his last name is not Shinga. Uh, that's for the uh, WBO light uh, junior flyweight title. Uh, also on the 16th, you got uh, Oshak Foster against Abraham Nova for the WBC featherweight title. Um, February 17th, the big heavyweight showdown, unification on the zone pay per view. Tyson Fury against uh, uh, Alexander, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ozander uh, Usyk, which I know I pronounce his uh, first name wrong, but I'm the murderer of the English language. That's why I always say Usyk. Um, also on that card, uh, Joe Cordina against Anthony Kikasi. And uh, it's the return of Sergey Kovalev uh, at Cruiserweight, taking on Robin Sirwan Safar. Uh, on the 24th, February 24th on ESPN+, Plus, you got Takuma Inoue against Jerwin Asias uh, for the WBA Bantamweight title. Alexandro Santiago against Junto Nakatania for the WBC Bantamweight title. And Kosi Tanaka against Christian uh, Rangel for the WBO Junior Bantamweight title. Uh, that's uh, taking place in February. And then, of course, I, I mean, we'll get into the March schedule uh, in, the, in the future. But uh, March 8th, mark that one down uh, from Saudi Arabia. Anthony Joshua against Francis Naganu. And uh, Zili Zhang against uh, Joseph Parker. Uh, two big fights on that. Uh, the rest of the card is going to be uh, fantastic as well. Uh, love those uh, uh, events in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's for sure. Um, all right. So this weekend, we got uh, a couple of fights that I just want to talk about. Connor Ben. This is taking place in Las Vegas. Um, Connor Ben is the main event against Peter Dobson. Uh, Connor Ben. Uh, is uh, 27 years old, um, and uh, his record is 22-0 and 0 with 14 of his wins coming by knockout. He's an orthodox fighter out of the U.K. Uh, he's got, uh, he's five foot eight uh, in height. Uh, he's ranked uh, number 19, number 19 by the computer, uh, and uh, the WBC has him ranked at number five. He's not ranked at all in the WBA, IBF, or WBO, which I find strange. Um, you take a look at this guy's record, and uh, he's been beating quality opposition, opposition uh, since 2020. And if you do the math, that's his last six professional fights. 
Uh, he beat, uh, in, in November of 2020, he beat uh, Sebastian Formella. Uh, he beat Samuel Vargas in uh, April of 21. He beat Adrian Granados in uh, uh, September of 21. Uh, both, uh, all three of them, good fights. Um, he, he beat and stopped um, uh, Chris Algieri in December of 21. Granted, Chris Algieri, uh, you know, was uh, older by then, and, and so was uh, Chris Van Herden, who he beat in uh, April of 22. Both of these guys knocked outs. Uh, his very last fight was against an experienced fighter. He won a 10-round uh, decision over Rodolfo Orozco uh, in uh, Florida. Uh, but, uh, but this guy's been fighting some quality opposition. I like Conor Ben. Uh, he's stepping in the ring with uh, Bronx native uh, Peter Dobson, who's not ranked anywhere uh, because he hasn't fought in a, uh, almost a year and a half, uh, more than a year and a half, one year and eight months to be exact. Uh, he's 16 and 0 with nine knockouts. He's 33 years old. He's five foot ten. He's got a two inch uh, height advantage. Um, no one on his resume, not one win of those 16 wins, is anybody that. I would be bragging about, um, you know, despite what I would think he gets, which is great sparring. He's from the Bronx and, uh, New York has some great fighters. There's no question about that. Uh, I, I see Connor Ben stopping this guy. Uh, I know that he hasn't lost yet, but he's going to lose this weekend. Uh, I'm picking Connor Ben. And the other fight I want to talk about was a fight that, uh, a fighter that I had mentioned a, a few weeks back as a fighter that I, I really am keeping an eye on. He's a heavyweight uh, out of uh, the UK, Johnny Fisher. He's 10 and0 with nine knockouts. Um, he's six foot four, which isn't a monster by today's heavyweight standards. Um, he usually uh, comes in around um, 238, 240 pounds. Uh, so he's, he's a big guy. He's in good shape. He's not fat. Um, you know, his, his, I think his fight, which he's going up against, uh, Dimitro Bezos, uh, I, I, I think on paper, this is going to be the, the toughest fight of his career to date. Uh, he did win the BBBSC Southern area heavyweight title, which was vacant, but he fought Henry Armstrong. Uh, I'm sorry, Harry Armstrong. Uh, who was 5-1-1 one and, one, uh, and and stopped him in the seventh round. Uh, I do believe uh, Bezos is, is going to be the best fighter uh, to date. 6-4, uh, he's given up two and a half inches because Bezos uh, is a pretty big guy at six foot six and a half. Uh, he's not ranked by uh, anybody, neither is uh, Joe Johnny Fisher. The computer ranks him at 180th in the heavyweight division. Uh, in contrast, Bezos is ranked 265th uh, by the computer. Uh, as you know, the computer bases their rankings on who beat who and who they beat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I, you look at this guy, he's 10 wins, one loss. He was stopped in that loss. He's got five of his wins coming by knockout. All of his wins against weak opposition. His best opponent that he ever stepped in the ring against was David Adderley. And he was stopped by Adelie. That's his loss in the second round of a scheduled 10-round fight. How's this fight going to go? I think Johnny Fisher is going to introduce himself to the uh, United States crowd. This fight's in Las Vegas. And uh, Johnny Fisher is going to win by knockout. Uh, I got a couple of emails I want to read. Uh, he said, uh, uh, I got a comment from uh, my man Amok. He says, Floyd Jr., is Lance Armstrong 2.0, except he never got caught. Plus, his marketing gimmick uh, is his fake zero on his record. Old, unbiased, hardcore fans remember Floyd Jr. losing to Castillo in the first fight. And and you know what? You could make the argument that Oscar De La Hoya beat him, too. It, it was an extremely close fight. And if you recall, Oscar's own corner told him to stop fighting, that he got, had to fight in the bag. That should be a, a, a lesson that every fighter learns. Don't ever pussyfoot around in a fight. You know, I, I, I forget who it was. I used to remember the name, but there was a fighter on ESPN. I'll never forget this. I forgot his name, but I won't forget the fight. He's fighting, 
and the corner's telling the the guy's going, I could stop this guy right now, and he and he was, he was battering him, and the guy was in trouble and everything, and his corner tells him, no, no, don't stop him, don't stop him, you need to get rounds, you need to get rounds in, and guess what happened? The other guy catches him and knocks him out, and he lost the fight. You know, rule number one, boys and girls, when the bell rings, end it as quickly as you can, end it as quickly as you can. Which reminds me, somebody was commenting on the announcement um, that Akira, uh, Akira Stevenson uh, said that uh, Shakur Stevenson said that he's retiring. Which, listen, this is just coming from, in my opinion, and I commented on it. It's just coming from a, a young fighter who's frustrated with the business side of the sport of boxing. Uh, Stevenson wants to fight uh, all the big fights, and nobody wants to fight him, you know. But uh, but I, I will tell you this, that, um, you know, and, and I, I don't think that he, uh, uh, I don't think that, you know, he's really retired. But I, I tell people all the time, you know, and, and I saw this comment on social media saying, oh, why would he, why would he want to retire? He can make all this money for, for, you know, half hour's work. No, it's not a half hour's work. It's, it's not the time in the ring, boys and girls, because true fighters are putting their heart and soul all their time into training. The fight is just the end of the of the whole sequence of what goes into a fight. The dieting, the, the exercise, the sparring, the working out, the sacrifices that you make. That's what fighters do. It's not just what you're friggin' watching on TV for 10 or 12 rounds. That's, that's the end. That's the highlight. That's the load that they're shooting, you know? I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, a true fighter, you know, and, and this is where I give Floyd credit. Floyd was always in shape. You know, we could say what we want about him being a track star and ducking all the fights and fighting people when they were on, uh, you know, Jared Tall and, and all this other stuff. But the truth of the matter is, is even to this day, Floyd Mayweather has always taken care of himself. He's always been in good shape and he's always prepared. That was my knock on Manny Pacquiao, which I think was a better fighter than Floyd. But the fight against Pacquiao and Floyd when it came to light that Floyd, uh, that uh, Manny had hurt his shoulder and didn't want to disappoint everybody. And, and, and I was very critical on this show. And I said, Manny Pacquiao made a bonehead error, should have never done it because you could bet your last penny, your last penny, that if Floyd Mayweather wasn't 100%, he would have never stepped in the ring. He wouldn't have gave a rat's ass about what the fans would think, what the promoter would think, what the venue would think. He wouldn't have given a rat's ass about that. He is prepared, and he wants his body, his mind, and his soul 100% ready to fight, which all fighters should do. So I don't want to hear an excuse that you got in the ring when you shouldn't have and all of that stuff because it's up to you as the fighter to be your best when you get in the ring, and it takes a lot to get to that point. And whoever doesn't believe it, don't know boxing. All right, um... Don't forget, we're dying to do a show in Clinton McKenzie's uh, gym in London, McKenzie Botton Boxing Fitness. Uh, if we're trying to get some sponsorship, if you know anybody uh, or uh, if you want to do it yourself, hey, bring us over there. I think that this show would thrive in England, and uh, uh, Clinton McKenzie has uh, opened up the door for us uh, should we get over there. So help us out. Um, all right. I got uh, uh, a couple of emails. Uh, this one's uh, from my man, James. Uh, he said, uh, uh, I read your book about the life of Tom Molino. Uh, wow, I'm so happy you brought this story to the public domain. I just wanted to say thanks. Hey, thanks for reading the book, James. And uh, if there's anybody else out there that uh, hasn't read it, uh, read it. And, you know, it makes a great gift. I think everyone should buy five or six copies, you know, and you, sh you can go on Amazon and, and buy yourself a dozen copies right now. I mean, uh, do it. Uh, okay, the other Alex, the old-time other Alex sent me a, uh, an email um, about uh, his title was uh, Boxing Thoughts. He says, hey, Billy C., what's up? Glad to hear the new episodes. Uh, wanted to touch base uh, on a few topics that you've discussed recently on the shows. Uh, two fighters I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the last few years are Ezra Charles and Sonny Liston. Two great fighters. Two great fighters. Ezra Charles is a bit underrated in my opinion, but um, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. Uh, he says, even though, and you all know how I feel about Sonny Liston. We had one of the 
uh, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to get Paul Gallagher back on here. Uh, he was making some um, statements about the death of uh, Sonny Liston and uh, some great stuff. I, 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 it reminds me, I got to reach out to him. We'll get him back on ASAP. Um, anyway, he says, uh, even though both were world champions, I believe both are criminally underrated in a historical sense. I agree with you, and I love, I love that, uh, I love that description. He says, after Marciano retired, I think you can make a good argument that Liston was the best heavyweight in the world for years. I agree. He says, uh, while Floyd Patterson was getting dropped against guys like Tom McNeely and Pete Rademacher, who incidentally got a shot at the the title. Uh, He was an Olympian guy, and next thing you know, he gets a shot at the title. But he says, uh, at the same time, Liston was knocking out Zora Foley, Cleveland Williams, who had a granite chin, uh, Nino Valdez, and Eddie Machen. Machen was a great fight. Uh, Patterson was protected. Customato wouldn't let Sonny anywhere near Patterson because he knew what would happen, which which was exactly what did happen when they finally fought. Sonny's title reign should have been much longer than it was, and I believe people truly don't know how good Liston was. The first title reign of Ali is the version where many historians have said that Ali hey, made have been, might have been unbeatable, but when you put it in perspective that several of the fighters Ali dominated during his period were guys who had previously been destroyed by Liston seven years earlier. Great point. Love the point, Alex. He says, uh, on to the shoulder roll. Uh, you were talking about this after Ryan Garcia was using it in his last fight. He was using it poorly, in my opinion. It was a joke. It was a joke. You know, the shoulder roll... Um, you know, I mean, you're supposed to be able to use it as a defense, but also be in position to, to, to hit somebody, you know, uh, he says, we have a whole generation of boxing experts because of YouTube fans that have become experts by watching PBC garbage. Oh my gosh. I should have reread. I should have read this before the PBC is, uh, it's, it's, it's garbage, garbage. Um, and Mayweather fights. Apparently, Mayweather is the king of the shoulder roll, he says with a question mark. This is what the Internet uh, tells me. He says, I guess these folks don't know who Jersey Joe Walcott is. He was doing the shoulder roll 70 years ago and doing it well. A hundred percent. I got to stop reading it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Jersey Joe Walcott was the one that would, was doing the shoulder roll. And I'm, I look at, you know, I'm in my studio. It's also a, an office, and it's, if you were ever here, you would see it's all uh, this boxing uh, photos all over. And right there is uh, one of my prized photos. I actually got it. Um, I actually got it in a, in a small shop in, in the village of Lake George. It's a Rocky Marciano uh, photo that's mounted. And it's, now now considering when he fought, how they captured this photo, and I'm sure you've seen it, if anybody ha- has seen these uh, photos, but the photo, and the cameras weren't even as good, was caught the, the exact second when Rocky was landing this crushing punch on Jersey Joe, and his whole face is disfigured. I mean, it looks like an alien. We see it today a lot because... The, the quality of the camera shots are so much better in the video and everything else. But it wasn't the case back in the 50s. And uh, this is, it's one of my favorite shots, and I'm looking at it right now. And, uh, you know, Jersey Joe uh, was a great fighter. You know, as uh, Alex mentions, you know, as a Charles, I mean, these, these are guys, you know, th- this, is, this is, you know, now I'm, now I'm off topic, but this is what bothers me about the younger boxing fans today. They don't value this. You see, to me, and and I, you know, I'm I'm a boxing guy. I'm a football and baseball guy. I mean, those these are my three sports, right? And and yes, I I, I do know the the history of of both uh, all three: boxing, uh, baseball, and football. Um, but I I don't know if I if I believe that a fan needs to know all the historical facts about. Uh, football and baseball but I do think they need to know it about boxing because of the nature of the sport and it's a one-on-one it's not a team sport you know and and the sacrifices that fighters of yesteryear made uh and and the advantages 
that today's fighters have because of the nutritional breakthroughs and the training techniques and the safety issues um, that these guys did not have. And considering that it was uh, the most popular thing, like when I was a kid back in the early 1900s, just kidding, I'm not that fucking old. But, you know, when I was a kid, we used to play a game called King, uh, the King of the Mountain. And when you threw everybody off the mountain, what did you say? I'm the heavyweight champion of the world, right? You're the king of the mountain. The ultimate title to have was the heavyweight champion of the world. You know why? Because there was only one. There was only one heavyweight champion. There was only one. You know, now, what? you know, you, you got four major sanctioning bodies, and then you could sprinkle in interim heavyweight champs, champion in recess, champion of Murtai, uh, champion because he, he, he got a bloody nose so he couldn't fight. So, you know, all this other crap. You know, um, and these are the guys that went up the ranks and and climbed the ladder. The top 10 contenders, number 10 fought number nine. Number The winner of that got to fight number eight, and blah, 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 blah. Right up the ladder till you got a shot at the title. That's the way it was. You don't see the shit that goes on today. You didn't see it back then. Anyway, um, he says, uh, the point of a shoulder roll is to lure the opponent forward by tucking your chin behind the shoulder and turning sideways. If done correctly, the opponent is a sitting duck for a straight right hand. No one I see doing this technique today is following up with the straight hand. That's the whole point of the strategy. Oh, I love this sentence. He says, the sweet science is about putting yourself in a position where you can hit your opponent, but he cannot hit you. Correct. Be in a position to, uh, to hit your opponent so he can't hit you. But you have to be in position to hit him. Mayweather would make guys miss with the shoulder roll, but he wouldn't land the right. And he wasn't in position to hit them. Floyd Mayweather, he would run. You know, so, so you know, he, he and he says, oh, the sweet science is hit and not get hit. No. The, the complete definition of the sweet science is hit and not get hit. But be in position to inflict damage on your opponent. That's the rest of the statement. You know, Floyd never says that part because when he ran away from somebody, he wasn't in a position to hit his opponent. You know, great defense is a guy like like Vasily Lomachenko. Vasily Lomachenko, you're standing right in front of him. You're you're two feet away. He's hitting you, spinning, pivoting, and he's nailing you, and you can't hit the guy. That's friggin' sweet science. That's defense. That's what it is. Um, he says, uh, I'd recommend a video. Uh, I'd recommend videos of James Tony, another one, using this technique against Mike McCallum and Iran Barkley if people want to see how it's really supposed to be done. You know, people remember James Tony after he was a scar smoking, beer drinking heavyweight. But, you know, during the days of uh, fighting Mike McCallum, the body snatcher who was quite the character. I had a chance to hang out with him one time in Vegas. Um, and Iran Barkley, who I love, one of the most uh, underrated guys because everybody, uh, uh, yeah, Amuk is saying Whitaker had defense. He did. And, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, he had that, you know what? He had that mean streak. He was a guy I should have mentioned when I was talking about Terrence Crawford at the beginning of the show because uh, uh, Purnell had that uh, mean streak too. But uh, anyway, thanks for the email, Alex. And, uh, Hey, listen, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Again, I want to apologize uh, for the uh, uh, late time start change, uh, but I wanted to get the show in. I wanted to get my thoughts on uh, Canelo Alvarez uh, potentially fighting Terrence Crawford. I still think it should happen. I, I support it. I, I want it to happen, and I made an early prediction that Terrence Crawford will beat Canelo Alvarez. And Terrence, if you're listening, you know you're my man. Uh, but I hope that you're starting to gear yourself uh, towards that fight. It's going to happen because Canelo, uh, and maybe it won't, you know, but I, I think Canelo is smart enough to know that a loss uh, doesn't hurt him ever. He lost to Bivol. I would have liked to see a rematch against Bivol, but Bivol's got, uh, you know, some uh, a pretty tough fight coming up with Beater Beef. So uh, when that fight gets signed, sealed and delivered, but uh, we got a couple of good uh, cards coming up, and uh, I'll be back next week to uh, talk about uh, the fight that's uh, taking place Thursday night, the night we do the show. So, uh, uh, and remember, 
if uh, you have any contacts with uh, Clinton McKenzie or anybody that, uh, uh, you know, wants to see us uh, do a show live from uh, McKenzie's gym, boxing fitness gym in London, help us out. Drop me an email. Uh, we're looking for sponsors. We want to get over there, uh, make it a party. I want to uh, hang out with the, the boxing fans in England because, you know, I know that you're the best fans. You guys know the sport, and I love the way boxing is handled over in the U.K. So uh, uh, drop me an email, bill at billycboxing.com or billy at talkinboxing, T-A-L-K-I-N-B-O-X-I-N-G. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all the comments in the chat room. Uh, and until uh, next time, make sure you tune in to the same channel, same bat time, same bat channel. Tune into this channel. Subscribe to this channel. Subscribe to our podcast and uh, buy my book. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Until then, ciao, baby.